Good afternoon, everybody. We've come to the end of summer, practically, and the reason this particular talk has been scheduled for this time is because we're at that period between summer and autumn when we pick up a harvest. And in this case, the harvest is quite a lot of fruit, as you can see here, and out of that fruit, we've made jam. So we're going to be looking at today the chemistry of jam making. Now, first of all, we start with a definition of jam and jelly. Now, jam generally refers to a spreadable, chunky textured mix made from both the juice and chopped or whole pieces of fruit. And jelly from the French gelée is made from strained fruit juice and is ideally smooth and translucent. Now, marmalade is citrus made from juice and the peels of oranges, lemons, grapefruit and the like. And all the wonderful jams of summer are basically creative exercises in chemistry. A variety of nature's chemicals, fruit, sugar, pectin, interact with each other under the proper physical conditions to produce your product. So we have A plus B plus C plus D gives us jam, sugar plus pectin plus at the correct pH and with the application of heat we end up with jam. Right. So now we look at some background into the making of jam and since ancient times future conscious households have put a lot of effort into preserving summer's bounty of fruit. As we come into autumn, we need to remember the context in which this was made necessary. It was a time that predates fridges and the ability to transport food across very large distances so that you actually can have fruit out of season as we can now. But in those times they couldn't, so they needed to have a way to keep all of that bounty of summer through the whole year till the next harvest. And the initial secret to that preservation was the sweetener. Now, before cane sugar arrived, the Greeks and Romans used honey. Now, honey is a near eternal preservative characterized by low water content, acidity, and it's got a helpful dose of antibacterial hydrogen peroxide. All of these, provided you bottle your honey carefully, will make sure that spoilage is put off indefinitely. So now we have more background. Apicius, in his oldest known collection of Roman recipes, mentions figs, apples, plums, pears, cherries and quinces, all preserved in honey. And this is a technique of preservation that we are told worked well reportedly, reportedly for preserving the corpse of Alexander the Great, but I find that's too much information for jam making. Now, when cane sugar became more readily available in the 16th century, it rapidly replaced honey in all of the recipes. So what is it that you have in it? Here's your summary of ingredients. You've got sugar, which preserves the jam from microbial degradation. You've got pectin, which sets your jam so you can spread it on your bread. Then you've got fruit. Well, that's the whole point of it. What do you do with your basket of fruit? Some fruit are naturally high in pectin, such as apples, blackberries, gooseberries, and quinces that were used in the past for marmalade and still are. Others, such as strawberries, don't have much pectin and they may then require you to add a dose of commercial pectin, so sugar. Let's have a look at it. This is an important part of jam. Uh, the sugar content is vital for flavour and it also plays a role in helping your jam set. The fruit is often collected before it's fully ripe, i.e. before pests get to the fruit and destroy the crop. So what we're actually dealing with is fruit that can be quite sour at the time at which you're trying to make your jam. So many jam recipes recommend the use of a one to one ratio of fruit to jam in jam making. And as well as sweetening the jam, the sugar can also help your pectin to set. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So sugar also, besides enhancing pectin's gel forming capabilities by drawing water to itself, uh, and in this way, stopping the pectin from remaining in separate chains, you'll find that sugar imparts a preservative effect. We've said that already. How does it do this? 
It does this by binding water molecules to itself and reducing the amount of water that is available in the jam to the point at which it's too low for microbial growth. This helps to ensure your jam doesn't go off too rapidly after it's made, which is very important in the past for proper preservation. The final content, sugar content of your jam should be between 65 to 95 percent. And sugar attracts the water, yanking it away from pectin, which boosts then network formation and enhances the gelling process. Sugar's water grabbing activity will also help prevent the growth of mold and bacteria because now no water is available for the microbes to live off and hence that enhances its preservative properties. So sugar not only sweetens the jam, it helps to maintain the colour, the brilliant colour of the jam that you see in your jar. So now let's look at pectins. To make good jam, you need to know whether the fruit you're going to preserve has high or low pectin in it. And pectins, what are these? These are long linked chains of sugar molecules which are found naturally in plant cell walls. And although we refer to them in general as pectin, their structures are variable as well as hard to determine. And the general structure is given in the next graphic that I'm going to show you. And in reality, the overall structure can be much more complicated. Pectins are found in fruit, particularly in the peel, the outside part, and in the core, the inner part, right in the middle. And when your jam sets, the, pe the pectin will play a vital role. So as a mesh of long chain polysaccharides, that's what pectin is, it will act as the structural cement for your jam. More about pectin. Pectin is a structural acidic heteropolysaccharide, galactouronic acid, and sugar in pectin is derived from the monomer galactose. Now the quality of your jam or your jelly that is made depends largely on the internal gel strength that is formed by the pe pectin. And the bonds that pay, play the most important part in that gelling process will be hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic forces. Large numbers of hydrogen bonds between pectin molecules stabilize the gel structure. So in the jam making process, four types of interactions need to be thought about. We have done here the first three that we want to keep, but the fourth structure, the fourth kind of interaction we want to minimize. Let's have a look at them. First of all, we've got a hydrogen bond, which is a special type of dipole-dipole attraction between molecules. It is not a covalent bond to a hydrogen atom, but it, it results from the attractive force between a hydrogen atom covalently bonded to a very electronegative atom, such as nitrogen, oxygen, or fluoride atom, and another electronegative atom, not within the molecule. So we then have another kind of bond, as I said, which plays an important part, which is your hydrophobic bond. And these molecules, what they do is have an interaction with each other because they are by nature hydrophobic, i.e. water disliking. These groups interact with each other in order to avoid or to exclude being close to a water solvent or a polar solvent. As you know, water molecules are polar. So we then have a third kind of interaction which plays a part in forming your gel. And this is your van der Waals forces. These are forces that are very weak and they're driven by induced electrical interactions or transient dipoles between one or two more atoms or molecules that are very close to each other. And these are very weak interactions between two molecules, but collectively over the entire collection of molecules that form the jam mix, they will add some sort of strength to it as well. Finally, you have something called electrostatic repulsion. This is the fourth interaction. This one we want to minimise. Electrostatic repulsion is the result of interactions between the electrical double layers that surround particles or droplets. And the force of this electrostatic repulsion is between like charges, negative and negative, or positive and positive. And this can be calculated. It is known that there is a force of repulsion 
between two similar charges and of course this is the opposite of electrostatic attraction. We want to minimise this as I said, the last one. So let's have a look at the structure of pectin. This is a linear chain that is displayed for you on the right hand side and on the left hand side of the slide you have your uh, monomer and it's made by, the chain is made by alpha 14 linked D, del, D galactouronic acid that forms your pect pectin backbone. Now we're going to look at, we've looked at sugar, we've looked at pectin, we're going to now look at C which is about acid. So more about the acid connection in jam making. Now the hydroxyls of pectin, water and sugar can form hydrogen bonds with each other, we've said that, because of uh, the way in which they, the, the components that make up the molecules. And the hydrogen bonding is promoted by a decrease in pH because you have a decrease in that fourth interaction, electrostatic repulsion. So what we're saying down here is to decrease the pH means to increase the acidity because the smaller the pH number, the more acid the thing is. So we now have here, in addition to weak van der Waals forces between the methoxy groups, all of these are going to interact to contribute towards your gelling process. And at a pH that is greater than 4.5, so your number's creeping up, it's becoming less acidic, you have a chemical reaction called beta elimination, which occurs during the thermal processing of food. That means during the boiling up of the jam. And what happens is that this will cause the loss of your texture, a decrease in the viscosity of the food product. In other words, it's not going to gel. And so it's going to not be a particularly good uh, gel consistency. So we now have some information about the actual acids. Acids, as we said, are important to help the pectin set. What happens is, why is it they have an interactive, why, why is it they play such an important role? Now, in pectin you have COOH groups, and these are usually ionized. Ionized means your hydrogen atom has gone off, your hydrogen ion has gone off, and it leaves behind a COO minus. And what happens is the negative charges, CO minus and COO minus, between two molecules will cause repulsion. And this repulsion then will prevent your pectin chains from being able to form your gel network. So if you can reduce the pH by adding an acid all the way down to between 2.8 and 3.3, you will prevent the COOH from losing its H. So it stays as a sort of a neutral group, COOH, and then it's not ionized and you're gonna have less electrostatic repulsion. So have a look at the acids that play a part. Fruit acids naturally occurring ones, one of the best known ones is your citric acid. Then you've got malic acid and tartric acid as well and while some acid may be contributed by the fruit that the jam is made from since as we said it's already in the fruit, Often it may not be enough to get you all the way down to the 2.8 to 3.3 range that you want. So what you do is you add more. And you can add it in the form of lemon juice, which is what everybody does. They just squirt the lemon juice in, or you can use fresh lemons and squeeze them. Or you can use powdered forms of acid. And then you have a bit of the diagram here to show you the acids. I've got citric, malic, tartric tartaric acid. And so now let's go to the process. Boiling the fruit up, A, will release the pectins from the fruit that we're trying to turn into jam. So it gets out. And with the correct amount of sugar and acidity, your long pectin chains can bind to each other via the intermolecular interactions we've already discussed, forming a gel network. And the network generally forms at a particular temperature. And this temperature is called your setting point, and it's at about 104 degrees centigrade. Now, once it has formed, the jam is then allowed to start cooling down. So the setting point is the point at which it just begins to form that network. 
and as it cools down, the gel network that is forming will trap the water content in the jam, leading to the process of setting. So I've got down here some jars of jam that I've made, and that's the fruit that I used. I didn't have to add any pectin into it because I used apples, and apples have enough pectin. Did you know that Marie Curie loved making jam? And just as a small aside, I actually found an article in um, my old copy of Chemistry World, and it said that Marie Curie's desire to share her science for the common good priced her out of the game. Well, besides all of that, relating to her discoveries, she liked to make jam as well. So let's have a look at what she did. So Marie Curie, as I said, jam maker, her home, she kept meticulous accounts, of course, of her work in the laboratory, but she also kept account of what she did at home in the kitchen. And she used to have seasonal entries for fruit for making jam. And the summer of 1898, during which she discovered polonium, as you do in your free time, also found her putting up a batch of gooseberries. And in the gooseberries, she used eight pounds of fruit and eight pounds of sugar to make 14 pots of jelly. And <laughs> this gives all of us kitchen sink scientists hope that we too can be Nobel Prize winners. Okay, so here we have the chemistry of jam making in a slide that brings everything together. There you've got amount of sugar that you need, 65 to 69% required final sugar content for it to really last for a long time and to have good setting. If you are not going to keep it for very long, you don't need to use that amount of sugar. Then you've got your pectin, and there is a range of all the different kinds of fruit you have. The ones that are higher in pectin on one side and the ones lower in pectin on the other side. And then you'll see down here your fruit acids with your optimal pH for setting, which is 2.8 to 3.3. In summary, the three factors, pectin, sugar and acid, have to be in perfect balance for jam to set and to taste good, both. They're two different things. If it doesn't, you can often point to one of these three factors being somehow amiss. After all, it could taste great, but be too runny or have a consistency of a rock, which means you can't spread it. Or it could have a perfect consistency, but be too sour to taste any good. So then we have the reason why we need to understand the chemistry behind why jam sets in the first place to ensure we have the right texture and also the right amount of sugar, depending on how long it is we want to actually keep it. Now, I have a little shortcut here because we live in a time and an age where we can get anything we want, any time we want. I'm not that fussed about how long it actually lasts. If you can't be bothered with perfectly set jam or details chemistry and measurements, just cook the jam the fruit up, sorry, with lemon juice and sweeten it to taste. And then store the hot mixture in clean jars with greaseproof paper in between the top of the mixture and the lid. Use the resultant mixture as a spread on bread or as an ice cream topping or pie filling or as an accompaniment to cheese. Uh, this shortcut provides you with a no stress mechanism for dealing with lots of fruit and not feeling like a kitchen failure when your jam doesn't set. Happy eating. Thank you.